Welcome to DIY 360 at IPR. I'm Kevin Bow, and this is Jeremy Ilvesacker. And uh, today's hello. assignment would be to say that three times fast. Um, Jeremy is a local guitar player in about, last count, I think 19 bands currently. Two good ones. Two good ones, and uh, several that he just recently got kicked out of. <laughs> so um, I thought it would be good on a couple of levels because this guy is a good example of... Uh, you know, a f life fully immersed in music and being a working musician in a lot of different diverse situations, um, as well as the nerd aspect, because he's a really good guitar player. So um, I can know we can ask him a lot of questions about stuff that nobody but guitar players care about. Um, but first, I would like to start off with some uh, deep background and some. The focus of DIY 360 is probing and in inappropriate questions. Into it. All right, good. Uh, so where are you from? Uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. It's nearby. <laughs> I was born, uh, grew up in the western suburbs, Plymouth and St. Louis Park. Ah, yes. But you're not Jewish. No. And I am Jewish, and I grew up in Wyzetta, which was horrible. So that's weird. We should have traded. Yeah, it went well for me. It, it, w it went well for you? Yeah, it did. Really? St. Louis Park's a good suburb, a lot of trains. It's the best run of all the city governments. I've actually read studies. I'm totally not kidding here. The trains run on time in St. Right. Louis Park. <laughs> Ooh, wrong, wrong metaphor. Anyway, um, so how old were you when you picked up a guitar? Um, 10 or so, I think 10 or 11. Your parents got you one? It was an acoustic guitar or electric? No, guitar? my dad had a 12 string that he cut. Uh, he dug open, uh, what, it, well, what am I trying to say? He there's a certain type of tremolo system called a Bigsby that you have to, it needed the leverage of this weird body, so he dug that out. So it was like this wide neck for my little fingers. It was an electric 12 string? So, yeah. What kind? A Baldwin. Oh, wow. Yep. So I'd learned on that. He taught me uh, the solo for You Got Lucky by Tom Petty. That was the first thing, because it had the whammy bar, so I got to. Oh, right, yeah. Right, right, right. Your dad is, is a pretty good guitar player? Did he play in? He's pretty good. He's more of a, he's like a composer. He was playing psychedelic Christian rock in the 60s. Well, there's a genre. I thought you'd like that, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a specific human. <laughs> right, right. And um, so did you ever take guitar lessons, or did you just figure it out yourself? I took a lot. Oh, um, you did? I did, yeah. Where'd you take lessons at? A um, place in St. Louis Park called, uh, what was it called back then? Music Plus, that's right, and this guy named Craig Anderson. And he was a, it was a funny education I got because he like deliberately didn't let me learn, or anybody, he's got this method, didn't teach the pentatonic scale for a long time, which is like the most practical, like every Jimmy Page solo, that's all he knows. Because you know? he didn't want to you to fall into the blues habits? I think so, yeah. So everything is like, even like pentatonic scales are now like variations on other scales. So I don't know, I thought that was kind of interesting. So that is interesting because I learned on the pentatonic and I think in some ways I'm an example of why you shouldn't do that because I feel <laughs> limited in my soloing because it's very hard for me soloing, not rhythm guitar. I'm probably better on rhythm guitar than I am on soloing anyway. But part of it is because it's once you get into that pent world, mm -hmm. it's really, uh, it's hard to get out. Well, on the other hand, when you come from the other world, it's hard to limit yourself and like mean what you say in a way. You know, I feel like I need more words. If I was a poet, I need more words to say simpler things. But did you ever? Uh, so oh, first band, like, did you get together with some neighborhood dudes and? Yep, I did, and I had all the instruments, so they'd come to my house. Cause your dad had a bunch of my stuff. My dad had there. a bunch of stuff. We got a Farfisa organ and. Cool. Yeah. Which Your did, dad sounds cool. He was cool. You know, we sold that at a garage sale because it was big and we couldn't play Jump by Van Halen on it. It didn't sound too cheesy. So As opposed to this, like, Jump by Van Halen, which doesn't sound cheesy at Right, exactly. All. No. <laughs> Those things used to go really cheap in the 80s. Nobody wanted the DX7. Or they, only, they didn't want Farfisas or Whirlies or even real Clavs. They wanted DX7s. Yep, too I'm, heavy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you had to have a DX7. I remember... Newt Coupe Music Store, when it was at 28th and Hennepin, they bought out an old warehouse of keyboards and they were selling uh, clavinets there f uh, 
real ones, and they had like a hundred of them. And by the end, they were like, make an offer. You could walk <laughs> with a hundred dollars, and everyone, oh, I don't want that. I can get the better sound than, you know, than that stupid Stevie Wonder thing on my DX7. Now they're worth, you know, thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, whatever. Yep. Um, what was the first electric guitar then you got of your own? Uh, I think it was it was the era of the Ibanez and <laughs> Music Plus had an Ibanez whatever. It's all I really knew. I didn't know any Fender. I had this weird Baldwin that everyone made fun of. But you know what I learned about it is that it, I was I listened to a lot of Queen growing up too, and it's the same pickups as Brian May's guitar. On the Baldwin or on your Ibanez? On the Baldwin, they're Burns Trisonics. So oh. later I felt smart for having that, but <laughs> at the time it was such a corny. It's so hard to be ahead of your time. No. I know. <laughs> I've had been saddled with that burden my whole life. Look at you now. Yeah. People are going to be doing this in 20 years, <laughs> yeah. citing this moment. 20 years from now, there's going to be, it's like Woodstock, there will be a million people who are going to be saying, I saw when Kevin Bow did El uh, Soccer on DIY 360, but really there was only you guys here. So let's look around the room here. Um, so your first band, was this covers, or do, did you... Nope, we had one song, and we were called The Paper Clips, and we played at the talent show in sixth grade. How'd you do? Uh, it, was, it was great. I actually loaned my guitar to somebody who lip-synced a different song, and she was holding it by the whammy bar, so it was like the strings were completely out of tune, so I was like still tuning it when they opened the curtains. Oh, God. But it was great. I've never heard it. people scream that loud since. Was, so you peaked was, early. <laughs> was, uh, yeah, exactly. It was, it was electrifying. I was right. addicted. But it, uh, it's true, though. All it takes is one experience like that, especially when you're at you know, a certain age, to be like, okay, that's it. I'm never going to be an accountant. I'm never going to be a lawyer. I'm never going to be a senator. I'm going to be one of these guys. That thought, none of those thoughts even occurred to me. It was just like, there, wasn't a ch there weren't choices. It was just all, all I knew about. So I know. I always feel like... With music, it's, did you ever read uh, The Hell's Angels, Strange and Terrible Saga, the first Hunter S. Thompson book? No. He's interviewing Sonny Barger, the founder of The Hell's Angels, and he says, you know, how do you, how do you find new people to be in The Hell's Angels? And Sonny looks at him and he says, we don't find them, we recognize them. Like it's, you were already born a Hell's Angel, you just didn't know it till someone tells you. And I feel like with music, people that, like you, are in this for the long haul, Mm -hmm. It is not a choice. It's like, the, you, it's like you just recognize it one day. Because if it was a logical choice, it would be not the smartest no. logical it's choice. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible, horrible idea. <laughs> we'll get into that more later. <laughs> so um, did you, have you done a lot of songwriting yourself? A little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess kind of a lot. A few hundred songs, some instrumental, some with words. I feel like I got pretty good at it about 10 years ago. And do you co-write with a lot of the people that you work with, or do you typically work alone when writing? Um, I mostly write by myself, but I've, I'm in a couple of bands where we just throw a bunch of riffs around the room, and then everybody vomits up a song, and then it's exciting, and those are fun. Uh, those are your funner, your, your like more for fun bands with other like musicians in town that are like a-level yeah. dudes? I would say that I have one of those bands. Um, and are, all of it is fun. Um, but yeah, other, other things are more... But more like selfish More fun. deliberately constructed. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's important to, to have that balance, I think, because I'm sure a, a goodly amount of your time is spent, and I don't mean to make it sound like it's, like it's horrible, but like making somebody else happy in a band or like working with a singer-songwriter, mm -hmm. a band leader, where your job is to make their stuff present mm -hmm. as good as it possibly can. And I know I'm in that position a lot too, and I think it's incredibly rewarding. But then there's the thing of like where it's just, it's a democracy band mm -hmm. and it's, it's a different kind of fun. Totally. And there's I've tune, uh, bands where I write most of the tunes, but yeah, it is then there's a different sort of tension in like being accountable for the content yes. in front of an audience where then like, then I look forward to sideman gigs where I'm just like, I'm just Me playing too. man. It's not my problem. It's <laughs> sometimes with my band, um, literally by the end of the night, I feel a, a, a literal, not a, not a metaphorical, but a weight on my shoulders. Like my shoulders are sore because mm -hmm. it's only a three piece band. And even though it's yeah. Peter and Steve and they, they're really, really good. It's yeah. still like so much pressure. Whereas in somebody else's band, 
you know, whether it's Allison Scott or Paul Westerberg, it doesn't matter. I just feel like, yep, I'm just the guitar player. All of it is good for you, though. It's good for you to make yourself like, you know, this is who I am. I hate, for some reason, uh, displaying it. Or some, it's really, there's a lot of tension in it somehow. It's, yeah, yeah. Even though it doesn't feel scary. It's like I, I feel brave because I have a guitar and like a loud band. And we just do it and we shoot our mouths off and scrape up. By the end of the night, I'm like, why, why am I so worn out? Yeah, or do, at, at the end of a night, uh, when you're backing somebody else up, well, also at the end of the night, you just put your guitar down. You don't have to like go settle up or there's just so mm -hmm. much that you don't have to do. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's kind of uh, freeing. When I'm doing the one thing, I kind of see the beauty of doing the other thing. And when I'm doing the other thing, you know what I mean? It's yep. like, um, so um, you're, you had bands in junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. What was the first band you got in or you were in that you felt like was really starting to happen? Um, you know, that wasn't probably i mean i loved doing everything and i i got lost in you know four track recordings and just sitting there by myself and I'm sure you can relate to that um but i didn't feel ever like i knew that whatever we were coming up with was going into the world well until i was about 24 or so what band was that i was playing in two groups at the time i was playing bass with this guy named barbara cohen and then uh farm accident barb cohen yeah i didn't know you worked with her i did that's wild and jacqueline alton and mark anderson we were the band we we're and that's the thing is like i could i just knew everybody sounded good and it was like a unified idea and it was beautiful sort of you know whatever i used um, to be super into jacqueline i played with yeah. michelle kinney yeah. in a band called summer of love back then Worst band name of all time. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Uh, and we were pretty bad, though, so it, it worked out pretty well. <laughs> uh, but um, I uh, was, uh, I used to uh, gaze at Jacqueline. These are cellists. These are the two premier queens of rock cello in town. Uh, and I used to gaze at Jacqueline. I mean, there's something about a woman playing a cello. Come on. It's something. It's yeah. so legitimate. It's so legitimizing. Yeah. You know what I mean? She has a super nice hair and everything. It's all, it's all a package. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark Anderson on percussion, who's just, I've only got to work with him a couple of times, but it's just, he's, he's out of this world. I mean, it just. Yeah, I learned so much about, like, r recording with him in particular about layers and, like, we would do bed tracks and then he'd have all these ideas and I had like no imagination for what was coming and then it would just turn into this other thing which gave me ideas and you know whatever so what was that band called uh little lizard it was barbara cohen and little lizard right so, so what, what time period was that 95 90 yeah something like that right and at the same time i was playing synthesizers in this band called detroit which oh are a bunch yeah, of yeah yeah a bunch of friends from high now school i remembered you were in that band yeah that you guys played at the 400 a lot? All the time. That's how I know Jay Perlman. Yeah. Like once a week. We were there yeah, that was a fun band. It was pretty good. We'd, that was when pyrotechnics were legal. <laughs> Pre-Great White. Yeah, they wrecked it for everybody. Yeah. Well, we did have the fire department there a couple times, so it was... <laughs> it's like, God, he brought a guitar synthesizer. Who were you listening to back then, do you think, that most... Uh, did you go through like I, I on guitar and songwriting music in general? I've go I go th used to go through phases like for six months it was just all Neil Young and Crazy Horse, and then another mm -hmm. six months it was all The Who. And you know this is I'm a little older than you, so this is like in the '70s. My formative musical years were in the '70s, um, and uh, then it was all over in 1980 when I first heard the Ramones. That mm -hmm. changed everything. But did you go through phases, or have you had some touchstones the whole time? To oh, tons of phases. I'm so ashamed of who I am. <laughs> really? Did you go through, was one of your phases Bachman Turner Overdrive? No. Okay. I think I would say it's much worse. I was really into like, you know, the Shrapnel Records roster, Cacophony and whatever, Joe Satriani, Steve Vai, like the 80s kind of Ibanez. Musician magazine. Players. Exactly. And so I, I, I never loved the music, but I always liked that it was possible. Maybe that's what it was. But then like, it's seductive. Technique is seductive like that. It's really, you know, and, you know, it comes down to, same with, like, battle rapping. It's like, you just basically want someone to beat your dad up is maybe <laughs> what it is. Like, this guy gets it, man. He's way better than my dad. I don't know. <laughs> That's true, but 
went too I wonder far. what Joe Satriani's kids do. They're screwed. Exactly. <laughs> There's like nothing, nowhere for them to go. But then I started hating that, that it sounded like they had to work it out ahead of time. And then I started, I mean, there's like another guy named Frank Gambali who's uh, mm. played more, it was freer sounding with like the shredding and <coughs> like that was, but then I started to hate the guitar period. So then I, that's when I became a bass player and keyboard player. And you, uh, you still play bass and keys and stuff? And I do, mostly guitar though. And more guitar? Which is good because like whatever, whatever I started rebelling against, well that's, that's when I got into like the replacements. I started to like turning phrases more than I liked guitar playing. Um, and uh, like Sly and the Family Stone, that's what my friends in the band Detroit were listening to, a lot of those kind of guys. And I uh, love those records. I was at the gas station the other day and there's a guy in, that lives in town here that played, actually, he played in Sly and the Family Stone for a while and then he played with Robin Trower, white guy. Whoa. Yeah, he still lives here. I think he lives in St. Louis Park, actually. Really long white hair. I, his name escapes me right now, but if you Google it, you can, you can, uh, Google you can find Google white it. hair. <laughs> Google the white guy in Sly and the Family Stone that's not Andy Newmark, right? Andy Newmark was the famous white drummer and a lot of this stuff. This guy was after that. His name will come to me like in a minute when we're not talking about this anymore, but I just ran into him the other day. Uh, time has not been kind to him. <laughs> He looks we'll really damaged. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Stay in school, don't do drugs. Um, so uh, you got into Sly and the replacements and more like um, Stuff that song felt, based it music? It felt a little more immediate, mm -hmm. I think. Less calculated. Even though it was precisely calculated, there was still just felt more alive, I guess. There's not much cooler than like, to me, uh, Sly, those Sly records and that that period of Marvin Gaye records, those later Marvin Gaye records and mm -hmm. stuff like that. There's something about the way the rhythm section works and the guitars and stuff like that. It's well, just the enthusiasm in the background vocals, you know. Yeah. And compared to like James Brown and James Brown, that's an amazing sound they make, but it just sounds so disciplined. It sounds like the army or something. It, does, it was. They're all scared I, to. <laughs> I know. To that's what I mean. Him. It's like that started sounding bad to me because it didn't sound fun to them. I don't know. It didn't sound like a joyful sound. Like, no, it's no definitely like Funkadelic sounds joyful, even though it sounds evil. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's evil, know. but it's fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So Detroit was a funkier band. It started that way, and then we got really into like new wave kind of sounds. And then after that, we're actually not good. We were all sort of not. Jeff was not a drummer. I was not a keyboard player. We just sort of switched it up. Bear is a great bass player, though. So he was like held the whole thing together. And so who was the first, uh, outside of Barb Cohen then or after that, who was the first, who are some of the other singer-songwriters that you've worked with? Because I think you've gotten a, a great reputation around the region for like, if you're a singer-songwriter, not in the Jerry Jeff Walker sense, but in the like modern sense, you get a lot of those gigs. I have, you know, and over time, and there, there are waves with it too, but I, I spent a lot of time out of town o over the last five years with this guy named Andrew Bird, which has simultaneously, like, legitimized what I do in a way, but also made me unavailable to Oh, that's <laughs> interesting. Up on it's that. ironic. So, yeah, so I really don't get a lot of calls. It's still, it's like still my old friends who I play with. Because people think you're gone all the time with I Bird? I don't know what it is. Or they can't, they think they can't afford me, but they really can. <laughs> Let's put it out there. He's, it's like on those rosters of booking agents where the, the bands, they, they put underneath their, their, their little picture and they're like, you know, country rock. And then it says, generally available. <laughs> That's what I want to put on my website. General, I'm generally available. I'm good to go. At a moment's notice. No offer refused. <laughs> I took out the reasonable and just no offer refused. It is funny, though, because you get to a point where you get some pretty good gigs and people do think that you're making all this money. And even, um, well, like you're on, on tour with Andrew Bird. I, I, I know how the money works in this business. And even someone like, you know, a local musician might look at someone like Andrew and say, well, you know, he probably lives in a mansion and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, he doesn't. He works his ass off and tours a lot, and you know he's making a living in music, mm -hmm. but he's not putting his kids through Harvard on it. You know not what I mean? Yet, you know. Yeah. I don't know. He's doing pretty well, actually. And, but he's an example of someone who's doing really well. But I just I think it's like okay, 
last week, okay, I just produced the new Communist Daughter record, and they got a nice write-up in Paste magazine. So Paste did what a lot of indie journalists do. And they went to All Music Guide to find out about me to get the credits and stuff, and there was a mistake in All Music Guide, and it said, um, Kevin has worked with Dean Martin. <laughs> It's like, dude, I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> Ring-a-ding-ding. So I was, kind of, I thought, well, I should leave it because it's cool. But then I thought, oh, it also makes me look like even old people will think I'm on the brink of death, whereas I want to be known as generally available. Right. <laughs> so it also, it also said on there that I'd worked with Joe Cocker. And I haven't. And I Googled it, and I found out that Joe Cocker cut one of my songs at the end of last year, and I didn't even hear about it. My publisher didn't let me know. Wow. I know. Matt Serletic produced the record. It's a big deal. Um, you know Dorian Crozier? Yeah. He played drums on it. So all this came out on Facebook. I was and just thinking about that guy. He's a great drummer. Yeah. He's a great drummer. He's from here, right? Yep. Yeah, and moved to L.A. So I've been getting emails like, well, that's great. Now you can retire. It's like, well, let's do the math for a second. <laughs> what do you think Joe Cocker is good for at this point in his career? If that record sells 50,000 copies, I'd be super impressed. I co-wrote the song, so my nine cents a song is down to four and a half cents a song. It's part of a publishing deal, co-publishing deal, lop off another 25%, and what I have left is like a new pair of shoes, mm -hmm. you know? Nice shoes, but one pair of shoes. Yeah. Well, and then a surprise $50 check every two years or something. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Unless it gets used in a movie. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Movie. Movie. Yeah. Movie. <laughs> yeah. But um, mostly I get emails from people saying, Joe Cocker, I didn't know he was still alive. And I was like, yeah. Mwah, mwah. <laughs> that's not good for your album sales. <laughs> people think you're dead. Um, so what else should we talk about? Why do you think, this is a good question, if I do say so myself, and I do, um, what do you think are the qualities that you have, not to embarrass you or anything, but um, that make you so hireable in these multiple situations? Because that's a pretty wide palette. Um, I do think that having a dad who was a songwriter, and he used to take me out on tour with him, too, as his bass player. At psychedelic Christian clubs? This was, he was more in a, like a Peter Gabriel-ish phase. This was the early mid 80s what was a band called it wasn't a band it was his name it was like lutheran churches and coffee shops you would not have seen him <laughs> i would have liked to yeah he's well he his health is getting kind of bad but he was touring till like two years ago really mm -hmm. and so that gave you a leg up because you could see how the whole big picture works uh i just uh i think he's just got a good depth of knowledge and his melodies are really rich, and I think, uh, like, whether or not I liked him all the time, <laughs> I think that that is w is important to me. So yeah, and staying out of the way of that, you know, or not not out of the way, but I don't know. And again, I've had enough phases of being a listener that I, I feel like I can be judicious about what I offer to a moment. I don't know. Something like that. <laughs> like being able to listen and play at the same time? Uh, no, just like just to where, where, what angle to come at it from. Because it's musically. It's just, you know, it's just chords and, a, and some words usually. And so. What kind of stuff are you doing with Bird? What's your role in that? How big is that band? It's four piece. And so what, what kind of stuff are you doing in that band? How, what, who, who, who do you get to be? Uh, there's a couple of things I think about. Because the music is like when he's built, well he built, he's a violin player and he builds a lot of his music with a looper pedal, like a lot of folks are doing these days. Um, so it can get kind of dense and polyrhythmic. So my instincts on the record were to like just play more of that kind of shoegaze sounds or dub sounds, just like. Can you give us some examples with the rig um, you have today? Yeah. Just like, uh, you know. <laughs> a watery backdrop to all the action and then like or wait waiting is a big tool in that band like wait to come in and then play something that kind of washes it all together well you know some of your 80s proggy kind of influences must bubble up 
in a way in that stuff. Because that's no, the first time I heard those. Well, I guess the first time I heard those kind of sounds was maybe Andy Summers that I was paying attention. For sure. I guess I did listen to a lot of them. But I, for me, it's going back and thinking about Kevin Shields. Or like My Bloody Valentine guy? Yeah, more shoegaze kind of sounds. Um, that's what I think I'm doing, but I probably sound more like Andy Summers since that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> what I actually listened to when I was growing up. You know, I just saw a picture of him on Facebook with a f keyboard friend of mine named Rob Arthur. And they were like hanging out. I th somehow they had a playing situation together, and I was like, huh. that must be fun, you know, playing with Andy Summers. He always seemed like the nicest guy in that band. Y yeah, for sure. If you yeah. watched any of the movies, yeah. not a lot of stiff competition. Only, only tolerable. Yeah. <laughs> So how about in Haley's? We just had Haley Bonner here for a DIY uh, a, a week or two ago. And what musical role in her band? Is that m more down to earth or more rootsy in a way? I'd say that's actually kind of similar. And then like when I play, like the recordings I've played on of hers, uh, Jake Hansen is also playing guitar. And we are coming from maybe similar places now via completely different influences. And so he's got kind of a watery sound too i guess mm -hmm. and yeah so what kind of sounds what kind of sounds are you using on the haley stuff is it similar those kind of it's real real similar yeah. liner sounds yeah not the steve miller song i mean right. literally the <laughs> trying to try to make be a steve miller tribute outfit. <laughs> so how about now your band that is with your uh with your music buddies is alpha consumer right mm -hmm. and so talk about that who's in that band and what's uh what's that like um, that's JT Bates, who's one of my favorite musicians I've ever heard. He happens to play the drums. He's really, uh, I don't know, he's really in each moment that he plays. It's one thing I like about him, but he's also really colorful and just nothing really feels the same twice. Plus, who doesn't like that guy? Yeah, he's I, that's, you're not gonna know that fella. JT Bates. I can't stand that guy. You're never he's gonna hear that. Me nuts. In Minneapolis, <laughs> yeah. I think the sense of joy, yeah, while he's playing must be really fun to be on stage with yeah yes yeah for sure it's he's an infectious human being um then the other guy is michael lewis who's actually one of the better saxophone players i've ever heard but he happens to play bass in our group he's a great singer too yeah and those guys have been playing together since the mid 90s and i've been playing with jt since then and i've been playing with mike for 15 years or so and there's just a lot it's you know it's easy Right. That way, it's also way more complicated the way that, like a family is, but on a personal level, you mean? Yeah, and musically, it's it must it's easy, but uh, you're saying, but it it must be it's also relatively sophisticated. The music? Yeah. You think so? I think so. Those guys don't suck. No, but it's a pretty simple thing we've assembled. How d um, do you guys? rehearse a lot or is it more no. <laughs> improv based <laughs> no it, it's not there are tunes and forms but it's still you just kind of we just don't have time to rehearse so it's built into it which is at first i found disappointing but it's like again man it just like comes to life when we're doing it and you know it's like that was too fast and it was like that was the tempo that happened that then at that moment after that song that was the one that happened so yeah there's no like wrong. eno's philosophies in music brian eno is like Maybe less deliberate than his yeah, philosophies, yeah, but yeah. yeah. None of those uh, those cards he makes. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Dan Wilson telling me when they were making a record, they, they used those cards and put them up and like... Have you tried that? I'm not that guy. Okay. I'm not that guy. I like it that there are guys like that, but I'm just not that guy. It's like, no one play an instrument that they are used to playing today, or you know, nobody hits a cymbal today, and all those kinds of things. I'm just... <laughs> I. I I think because of my background, I, uh, I'm very suspicious of artsiness. Now, that said, I love certain artsy music. I mean, I love Keith Jarrett and Joni Mitchell's 70s stuff and, you know, and, and a lot of out there, Roxy music and stuff like that. But I'm, 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 I'm maybe, to a fault, overly intolerant of what I might view as pretentiousness and stuff like that. I'm just mm -hmm. always suspicious that it's covering up um, so no songwriting. Substituting for an idea. Yes, a, a triumph of style over yeah. substance is what yeah. <laughs> some critic put it once, and I was like, yes, that's what I don't like. Yeah. You know, Too much up here and not enough here in region south, but that's just me. Um, also, I think it's a partly on a personal thing on, on my part due to my own insecurities, because I've never been, when I picked up a guitar, I wanted to 
be just a guitar player. Mm -hmm. I failed, so then I learned how to write songs, and I had success at that. And then when that, I st stopped getting big cuts, and I was like, uh-oh, I don't want to wait tables again. So then I started engineering and producing and mixing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so, um, I, but I always wanted to be the hot dog guitar player. I wanted to be the guy in The Pretenders. Yeah. He's the original guy. Uh, James uh, Honeyman's guy. Honeyman, yeah. He was amazing. He was like the only guy in, in, in new wave music that um, him and the guy from The Damned, where they could play like Jeff Beck influenced things and things like that, mm -hmm. you know? Now I think it's, it's, there's room for actual great players in hip music, but back then it was difficult. Yeah. I mean, back then meaning like early 80s. I don't know that people care about guitar players anymore. Oh, they totally don't. You think they do? I know they're. Does anybody in this room care about <laughs> guitar players? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So well we're all set. Uh, there's one sympathy wave there. <laughs> that was just a codependent. That was a Minnesota no, wave. I mean, of course I we do, Kevin. You're really coming along. I mean, the way the way that it was almost the purpose of music in the '80s was. L the, at least the horrible music I listened to was like waiting for the solo. It was just killing time, tolerating awfulness. Sure. And then now it's now that I've, I feel like now that the ideas are better and that, you know, the um, intentions may be more pure from the ground up, people aren't coming at it from a technical side. Not that I care. It just, I think. I you think, know. you know, t now that you mention that, technology has also influenced. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think you need to be some virtuoso. Kevin Shields is a perfect example, the My Bloody Valentine guy. It's not like he went to the Guitar Institute of Technology or anything like that, mm -hmm. but he was able to, using effects in, 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 in kind of new ways, I think, or at least very influential ways. Yeah, he thought he was ripping off other bands, but he was doing it wrong, like we all do, and then we yeah. accidentally become ourselves. And Why don't you do something wrong here? So show us some of your... Uh, some of your uh, I don't know, effects pedals and some of your chops. Uh, well, I don't know about chops, but I got, um, so in being a side person for people and trying to, whatever, just color what they're already good at that's already perfect and I don't think it needs me, but I'm like, well, they want me here, so what do I do? Then, I, getting good at that, I like try to start making songs that are only my contribution to those kinds of bands, so here's one of those.
Did you ever listen to Adrian Ballou or Robert Fripp back? No, I, I'm going. I, I had such bad taste growing up that I, I have to go back to find uh, all that. Because <laughs> some of that sounds. Ballou was very melodic in his, you know, in in the way he moved things around like that. So you you got the chord progression looping with Mr. Green thing. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. And just pile on harmonies and stuff. That's great. That must be fun. Have you ever done a gig alone? I've done a couple, yeah, and they're some of the best things I've done. But again, like, there's one time I was actually playing with Jake Hansen, this other guitar player, and, you know, like I said, we have a lot. We sound a little bit alike, and mm -hmm. um, it's just a really easy communication with them, and we just made this beautiful blob of whatever we were doing. And uh, it was at the Astor Cafe, and there's just some guy there going, play some music. You know, so... At the Astor? No. That seems, un I, I'm playing there Friday and I love that venue. Usually people are there for, th it's a you know, sophisticated, open-minded audience. I wouldn't say that this necessarily needed an open mind. It's just they, they weren't tunes. It was like, it, it was a little self-indulgent perhaps, but I, I don't think it was like in an ego way, which would usually be combative. Right. You know? But so it's I not like you're at bunkers. I mean, I know. I, I, just, I feel like our intentions were pure. They just met a person at the wrong time on the wrong day. I took a gig, <laughs> I met that guy the other night because I took a gig opening for someone just because they threw some money at me last minute at the Main Street Bar and Grill in Hopkins, which is a place I've never gone to before and I don't expect to be asked back anytime soon. <laughs> and I did it solo acoustic and there was a bunch of big bras playing pool in the back and one of them like yelled something a little physically threatening mm. to me, but I, I, I just kept on going like I'm assuming you guys did. Oh yeah. Sometimes I like the challenge. Yeah, it's good. And that, that was there was just a lesson. It was like, wow, I've never been more completely honest, like bleeding to death in public. And it, someone took it as a combative statement. I'm like, okay, what do I know? I'm just yeah. another person here. You know? I will melt you. <laughs> <laughs> I will melt you with my musical candle. Um, so uh, touring. If you had your druthers, do you, gun to your head, you prefer uh, working in the studio or touring? If I could make enough in a studio, I'd probably do that to stay home. Because you have kids now and you actually I have, have a grown-up life. But I, yeah, I make my money touring. Yeah, that's, I, I made more money than I've ever made last year, but I was gone, you know, a good, almost half the time. With Bird? With Bird. And then I started, I'm playing with Brother Ali now. So oh, really? That's got to be fun. It's great, man. I love him. I love what he's giving the world. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And I'm proud to be a part of it. But again, it's like, well, or I could be a grown man and, uh, you know, boy, I don't know. I'm not good at anything else, so here I, I am. But it's lucky that you are good at the many different things you're good at in music because how would you like to be, like, only that live guy? and be locked into that, and then have to take gigs that you didn't want to take, mm -hmm. you know, to live, uh, go tour with Huey Lewis or whatever. <laughs> Not, ass I shouldn't assume that you wouldn't want that gig. I think he's got his original guy still, so. Oh, damn it. Anyway, um, or if you're a studio guy and then all of a sudden the work dries up, you know what I mean? I, that's yeah. One thing I noticed now is back when I got into this business, you were a songwriter, or you were this, or you were that, and now, mm -hmm. I mean, you do a lot of studio stuff. You have a home studio? I do, yeah. I do mostly editing there, but I, I do some parts for people. That's great. Like, they'll send you an MP3, do your thing. Yeah. Dropbox it back to them. They send you a check, and, you know, just so efficient for people. and They can use what they like and not what they don't. And it's even better when it's like PayPal, and then it never even exists. Yeah. <laughs> nothing, nothing of the transaction ever exists. I've never met you. <laughs> we never created anything physical, and we get along perfectly. Yep. <laughs> um, so, uh, do we have any, uh, we have just a few minutes left here. Do any, who do we have in here in the audience that plays guitar? There's not a guitar player? There's a guitar player. Do you have any questions? Do you have a nerd question for Jeremy? This one? It's a J. Mascus Signature Squire Jazzmaster. 400 bucks. They're making them real good, real cheap these days. Where is that made in um, China? So no one got paid to make it. So, 
So you can feel good about that. Pass the savings on to us. And the whammy bar does not put it out of tune. That it falls out all the time. So yeah, no, it doesn't actually. That's great because that's yeah. half the battle. Yeah. Those things, even sometimes the supposedly good ones, mm -hmm. it's just like a has to be a magic one, I think, to to work. Yeah, this thing is just it's just good off the off the rack. It's real easy. A bunch of people have them now, and you can tell it's these colors and. Yeah. And what do you use live for amps, like when you're touring with, with Andrew Bird? Um, I've got um, a 66 Fender Bassman, which is looks like this, only a lot bigger, um, and two 12s. And then on the side, I've got this Gibson Net, which is an accordion amp. It's oh, I think I've seen you play that before. Yeah, it's like between the two of them, that one's really messy and kind of like more compressed sounding, and then the, the, did I say basement? It's a bandmaster. Um, oh, okay. That one is, uh, has more punch and, uh, and more depth, so somewhere between the two of them, I, you know, they can mix the microphones out front, depending on what's working that day. And do you play any acoustic guitar on that gig, or? I do. Yeah, he started doing that more. It's, I've done a little bit on the recordings, but then he started making me bring one on the plane to shows. And <laughs> That's not as fun as it used to be. No, it isn't, but I, the guitar I was using would cost $50, so you can usually find them. It's just a Harmony Stella. It sounds great, because we just gather around one microphone at one oh. point, point in the show, old-timey style. And the venues for that tour, is he playing mostly bigger clubs or small theaters? Both. Both? Yeah. That's fun. Do yeah. you prefer one over the other? Well, the energy of people standing is better, but then you wind up playing louder. Yeah. Which I think is counterintuitive. I think playing quieter in that situation would keep people's attention better. But the theaters, they listen better, but you don't get the energy back. It's a right. It's more of a recital feeling. But there's something. Yeah, it's like they're watching I don't know, a I movie like or something. Yeah, they're both cool. And in that, I think that music works great in a theater. I would like to see it in a theater because so there's so many details. I'd like to be sitting. <laughs> I like. I know. I'm. Everything is better sitting for me now. I, yeah. You know. I'm over 50. Just let me sit. You know. <laughs> um, how about with uh, Haley Bonner, touring? Uh, how is that different than touring with Bird? A uh, lot smaller venues, um, but exactly as fun. Just great people i'm lucky to know that you know that's the thing is like then actually so we did with bird we did like the conan o'brien show or something and two days later i was playing at a battle of the bands at whiskey <laughs> junction with my friend john so it's like <laughs> i'm playing music with my friends Ex it's exactly the same thing you know yeah those tv shows are wild uh what was your conan experience like i never great. did that i did the scottish guy Oh, yeah, we did that, too, and he, that guy wasn't there. When we he did wasn't it. there for mine, either. Really? We did the show in the middle of the afternoon, and they tape it, and then you watch it on TV, and he's like, oh, that was ju just great. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's like, really? So you enjoyed watching us on TV? Yeah, <laughs> or having someone brief you. Yeah, that was, um, and there was no audience, no studio audience when we did Ferguson. Oh, we had an audience, but yeah, we they were pretending to be excited. It wasn't, that was on a w Westerberg tour, and he was having... A rough day, so it was probably yeah. better that there weren't people there. Oh boy! Although the worst thing is, um, this is uh, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in show business, and for me, that's really saying something. <laughs> they bring you a bag of swag to your dressing room for those shows, you know, like a Conan O'Brien hat and all the t-shirts and all this kind of stuff. And they brought the Westerberg band a huge bottle of booze, like whiskey or something huge. It was like the size of a horse, and. Uh, I'm like, well, that's great. If you have Charles Manson for a guest, do you just give him a gun, a <laughs> firearm, before he goes on stage? So, of course, it didn't, I mean, I, w I don't drink, so it didn't do anything for me. But by the time we got on the stage two hours later, yeah. mistakes were made, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, well, what was it like? For Conan, I've always, I love that show. It must have been a trip. He is surprisingly mean to his writers. I would think of it. Uh, and he was a writer. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, he, you know... We saw his Tonight Show, like we did his Tonight Show, and I think he was like getting a Pressured. lot of pressure from, but I thought he was brilliant. He was curating the day's events, which were Michael Jackson died, and like Michelle Bachman said something dumb, and like <laughs> instead of actually dealing with each one, and there were like some 
tasteless jokes that he like turned into like silly jokes and then just did more arbitrary humor. Mm. I don't know, I thought it was good. And musically, did you have a good like stage mix and everything when you were playing on that? Yeah, I think the best one for that was the uh, Jimmy Fallon show. It was, it was the most kind of pro outfit. And these are all Bird? Yeah, I haven't done them with anybody else. Um, we, I had a student here that uh, now is like, I don't know what his title is, the audience coordinator at Fallon or something like that. I don't know if that means he goes out and gets them pumped up or what he does. But uh, So that was the, oh, did you get to like hang out with the Roots then? Mm-hmm. Well, that must have I been mean, cool. Sort of. You got to stand around while Questlove told stories or whatever. Yeah, I would enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to do that now, please. Um, do we have any other questions here? There's one in back. How would you describe how you get paid? It's, it's different every time. Um, but in that group that we're talking about, this guy, Andrew Bird, um, I was on a weekly salary for being out, which wound up being pretty generous, I thought. And then I also... Which is typical of bigger tours like that, weekly. Yeah. And I'm not sure what the other guys in the group got, but um, it's for some reason a conversation that's hard to start, you know? Um, <laughs> I don't have a manager for it, so... Probably didn't. That's probably a good yeah. move. But um, he also played two songs that I wrote, so I'll be getting checks for those at some point. Which nice. That's also a very generous move, I thought. You know. Yeah. Even though he just likes the tune and wants to do them, but he doesn't have he doesn't have to. I just had yeah whatever. And he cut them too. He recorded. He them? did. Yeah. And uh, are you a BMI or an ASCAP writer? BMI. Nice. Is that good? Well, I again, I don't have a, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> It's great. Okay, good. <laughs> no, BMI and ASCAP both do a great job. I was with BMI for 20 years at least, and then I just left for CSAC um, and asked me in five years if that was a good move or not. Okay. Um, so I have no idea, but it's just a great feeling when you get money in the mailbox for someone playing. Mailbox it. gig, it's the best. Yeah, yeah. I'm so old, I even resent the, the walk down to the, <laughs> to the mailbox. I'm like, can't <laughs> they just bring it in? Can't you guys PayPal me? What's up? Um, any other questions for this dude? You want to play us one uh, other little thing and then we'll catch your car before they tow it? Yeah. Oh, there's oh. a question. Sorry. Uh, what are some typical, uh, typical effects that you use when you're doing like the music? Favorite effects? Um, that's actually a good question. And I, I've been, I get obsessed with different things at different times, but like analog delay, like trying to get, I had a digital one, which was the um, Electro Harmonics number one echo, which I thought grabbed a cool part of the top part of the sound and got kind of hazy. Um, so it, it wasn't quite as detailed, so you could just kind of make stuff wiggle around. Um, and then I had like an Ibanez, like one of their vintage analog delays for like the W or kind of like that will corrode as they go kind of thing. But those all kind of keep breaking down, so I bought this mm. rocks and delay, which is like 80 bucks, and is somewhere in between those two and is just fine. So that's what I'm into nowadays, which sounds like this. Yeah, give us a demo. Elvis. <laughs> that sounded like the Three Stooges. That's super useful, right? The button. <laughs> out of that green line six echo pedal or do you use that mostly for looping i do I, you know i don't use the delays on there and i i think it's just because i'm lazy 
I don't want to reach down and too many move things, you know? I just wanted, like, that's the looper one, so when I loop, I step on that. <laughs> I, don't ha I always wanted that one. I have the modulation effects one, which has a great Leslie and a great, like, small stone phase shifter mm -hmm. and, a, and a flanger. Thing. Yeah, they're cool. They're cool. Yeah. And these echoes are they're good. I've heard people use them really well. I just I like to have step on a different thing to do that myself. Well, we should wrap it up because um, he's got to get his car. If he gets a ticket or gets towed, I'll feel really, really bad. But thanks to you guys for coming. Appreciate it. And thank you, uh, Jeremy Elvisacker. Oh, man. Thank you, Kevin.